night and I get this phone call from the adoption agency saying a little girl was born Saturday night and her bio mom chose me to adopt her and if I agreed I could pick her up on Thursday. I, apparently I yelled so loud everybody came running from all over the house <laughs> they thought somebody had died or something and, I, and all I could say was I'm gonna be a mom I'm gonna be a mom and I was like your dream is to become a mom my dream is to help you get there. I'm Rebecca Greenspan, a single mom through domestic adoption and an adoption consultant for over a decade. I'll be your guide, along with other adoption professionals and members of the adoption constellation, walking you step by step down this beautiful and complex path of adopting your baby. When I was going through the adoption process, I had no idea what I was doing, what I needed to know, or more importantly, who to trust. Well, after helping hundreds and hundreds of families grow through the beauty and complexity of adoption, I've learned more than a thing or two, and let me tell you, it's not always rainbows and butterflies. This isn't just another podcast sharing adoption stories, but it's for you if you're genuinely committed to diving in with an open heart, eager to learn everything there is to know about adopting a baby so that you can show up for yourself and your child in the best way possible. This podcast is for you if you're ready to put your newfound knowledge into action. Adoption isn't for the weak of heart, and it certainly isn't done when your baby gets placed in your arms. If that's what you think, I'm afraid you're living in la-la land. My promise to you is to keep it real if you promise to keep digging. We'll acknowledge the hard, and we'll also celebrate the joy that is adoption. You ready? Let's do this. Today, my friend Natalie Bauman joins me as our guest on the Adoption Roadmap podcast. Her life is a tapestry of unique experiences and incredible achievements. Natalie is not only an adoptee and an adoptive parent, but she's also a master storyteller and an award-winning video producer. Adopted at just 10 days old, Natalie always knew she was adopted. Her journey took an unexpected turn in her mid-20s when she met her biological family, uncovering secrets and connections that have shaped her understanding of family and identity. As a single adoptive mom of a now 17-year-old daughter, Natalie navigates the complexities of interracial adoption with grace and sensitivity. But Natalie's story doesn't stop there. Her passion for family history and genealogy led Natalie to a stunning discovery, which she will uncover in this episode. This revelation, combined with her professional expertise, has driven Natalie to help others preserve their family stories through her company, Digital Mosaic. Natalie has taught her daughter the importance of random acts of kindness, while I may pay for coffee for someone behind me in the line at Starbucks. Natalie is much more creative than that. They pay for the person behind them at a toll booth on the highway. <laughs> Today, we'll dive deep into Natalie's incredible journey, the lessons she learned along the way, and her mission to help others tell their stories. Welcome to the Adoption Roadmap podcast with my longtime friend, Natalie Bauman. Natalie? Hi, Hi, I'm going to jump right in. Sure. So as someone who has experienced adoption from both sides, as an adoptee, as an adoptive parent, what unique insights have you gained about the emotional dynamics involved in adoption? Well, I think you'll agree with this one. Every single adoption situation is totally different. And you could have the exact same demographics of a family, of the extended family of the adopted child, and the experience of that family is going to be totally unique mm -hmm. because everybody involved in the adoption triad, it impacts them so differently at different stages of life. Like you had mentioned I've always known I was adopted. It was kind of part of our family conversation early on. I still have the books that my mom used to read to me and my sister, who in interestingly enough is not adopted and is born three years after I was, which I think is kind of a common story. People think they can't have a baby, they adopt, then mm -hmm. voila. 
It works. <laughs> so we always read this book, The Chosen Family, and that's been kind of a theme for my life because my mom especially was so magnificent at making me feel like it was just a, a part of who I was. Like I was tall, I had green eyes, I was adopted, but I was just as loved and sometimes maybe more loved than I would have been if I wasn't because she wanted to make sure I knew how loved I was. So she was excellent at making me feel like I was special and they picked me special. And in truth, I think I picked them special too. Mm. Um, I think it's kind of a two way street. Um, but, you know, being an adoptive parent now, I take the lessons that I learned from watching how my mom handled the, those things, even though, you know, I grew up in mostly this, you know, late 60s, early 70s, and adoption was very much not a public discussion like it is today. It was, they would um, set you up with families where you looked like the family. So maybe you could fit in better. And it's more the idea of fitting in and pretending that you weren't adopted. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in a store um, at the Donna Lee store in Cleveland. Yeah, I remember that. I recognize that. And some lady says, you look just like your mother. And I was quick to yeah. say, oh no, I'm not, I'm adopted. And I remember my mom going, okay. <laughs> and it wasn't an insult and I didn't mean any you know, <laughs> negative feeling towards her that I didn't look like her. It just wasn't the truth. And I've always been a truth seeker on that level. And I think it was annoying, obviously, <laughs> to my parents. <laughs> I'm the same way. Yes. And I wasn't embarrassed about it either. I think I was just kind of always comfortable with it. Um, and I think I've tried to bring that same sensibility to my adopt my adoptive parent experience and be open and let my my daughter kind of lead the way of what she's comfortable with. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a journey and you kind of figure it out as you go. You can prepare the best you can, but you can't walk into the journey and not be prepared for the unexpected. Were there things also that you felt growing up as an adoptee? Like you, you talk about how you're you know, you took lessons from how your parents did it and, and you felt like they did it very well for you. And, mm -hmm. um, and I have to imagine that you felt certain things in your own journey as an adoptee who wasn't biologically related to your family. And did that play into, or how has that played into, um, your parenting with your daughter? Well, even, um, observing how it played into my life in general, you know, you always see the puzzle piece analogy, but it felt so true. I, there was always like a piece missing from the story. I had um, a letter that had been written by Jewish Family Service, whom I was adopted through, mm -hmm. with some basic biographic information about my mother and a little bit about my father. So I knew a teeny bit about them, but like this feeling of as, as, and honestly, I'm super close with my my family. I'm not even gonna say adoptive family. There's mm -hmm. my family, um, and all my cousins, and we have a huge extended family and lots of love, lots of warmth. But there's always a little piece that wasn't that wasn't there, and I I I know some adoptees don't feel that, and I don't know why you feel it or why you don't. I don't think it's from a lack of anything. I think it's more just an acknowledgement of the presence of. Your, you know, the, your gestation period and that biological and emotional connection between the, the mother and the child before you're born. I think that's relevant. And we bring that with us into our life experience. Um, and, you know, when I thought about adopting myself, I remember thinking it would be, it would be something that I would help that person navigate through, but understanding that I was coming in knowing that I wasn't everything. I wasn't going to be the child's be all end all. Maybe they'd be one of the kids who didn't want to search or wasn't feeling that same thing that I felt. I, I have friends who are adopted who never searched, never cared. Um, but because I had experienced that, like a longing, a wanting to be whole in some way that you just, it's inexplicable if you haven't experienced it. Yeah, I it's can't just imagine. the reality. And is that, obviously that's what motivated you ultimately to seek out your biological parents. Mm -hmm. So what was that search like? When did you decide that that's what you wanted to do? And what was, what was that experience like for you? I guess I'd always 
thought that it would be nice to meet them, but I really, even in my teens, I never really thought seriously of anything practical about it. It wasn't like anything like, oh my gosh, I can't wait till I'm able to do this. Um, when I got out of college and was starting to live my adult life, I started thinking about it more and more. And I remember having conversations with different people in the family about it. And my mom and I sat and had the, uh, many multiple conversations. She's a very thorough lady. And she really talked me through, like, have you thought about the ramifications if they are not open to um, bringing you into to the fold or to ex accepting or acknowledging you? Um, have you thought about what it would be like if they did? And really helped me kind of talk through all that stuff. And I remember it was, it was like a multi-month process. And then one day we talked about it and she said, okay, you know, you, sound, you seem like you're ready um, and you're prepared for whatever happens. And she handed me her phone number. Oh, so my, she had My it. mom had done, the, she had been Oh, she did. Her, okay. Yeah. She did so research. I, I had, so I had found out um, that I could um, get, I was like, I think with my birth or my adoption papers were filed within six months of Ohio's window where I could literally go down to the courthouse in Columbus and get my original birth certificate with my mother's name and my father's name if it was on there. And I was shocked to find that out because I hadn't known that that information was right there. I think after and that was, in, I think it was filed like 63 or 64. And I think after that you had to petition through the court. So it was a lot more paperwork, a lot more legwork to be able to do that. But for me, it was literally, I walked in there and I walked out with her name. Wait, so that was, just happened. Those records just opened a few years, not so long ago, I think. Um, so when was this? This was in the eighties. Oh, it was? 80, I thought like you were, I thought adoptees weren't able to get their original birth certificates until like, I don't know, like three or four or five years. Well, ago. no. So I, I don't know about the time frame from that point. Um, that's in, in the mid eighties, late eighties is when I went and got it. But oh, the, you, the records that were filed after I think 63 or 64 were locked. Got you had it. To, okay. you had to wait. So I don't know how the law has changed since then, but mine were filed before then. Okay. So and you're how old now? 62. Okay. So this Just to give been, context. About yeah, it. so okay. I was born in 1962, and I'm 62 now, which is Got funny. Um, and then I was adopted, as you said, at 10 days old. And, um, you know, my, it was kind of like a last minute, oh, my gosh, you're getting a kid in a couple of days. Like, they didn't know about me before a few days. I think it could have been as fast as two days I was born and then they found out about me and they brought me home like two days after they found out about me. So they didn't have a big window of time to prepare. And it was like this my cousins always talk about and my mom and my dad had talked about like this great celebration everybody like all the like 15 cousins came pouring in and my all my aunts and uncles who live nearby and it was just like this crazy love fest yeah. um and so like Doesn't later that make you I, feel good yeah to hear that and i want to stop there for a second because i think that's an important piece right there um Obviously, people understand that there's trauma involved. There's a birth mom who just handed over a baby, and that's traumatic, and that's really hard. And on the other side, you have the adoptive parents who are celebrating. And I always say to people, even through the journey, this child deserves to know they were celebrated throughout their entire journey to life. And there's this other side, but we cannot forget about the joy that this child deserves to know, look, we celebrated you. Yeah. So for all, there's so much hate online, right? To say, how dare you? This is disgusting to celebrate this blah, 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 this adoption. And I get it. I get where they're coming from. Yeah. And look at you. You have this story of this love fest around you and you know what the other side of that is. And you need that as a child to know how excited your family was to, to welcome you into the world. Am I, am I right? Did you? And I was also like, when I adopted my daughters, also super cognizant of the heartache on the other side of it. And now that I've learned more about my own birth journey and um, adoption, I know the heartache, it'll get me choked up thinking That's about it. Okay. I know the heartache on the other side too, that my mom went through my bi biological mom when I was born. And I've learned more about some of the family dynamics and some of the 
experiences there. And it just, it's, it is heartbreaking to know that. But at the same time, adoption is not the evil um, entity. It is a pathway to a different future for a child. Mm. Even though we're born into a physical family, there are many, many valid reasons why the child is not able to be raised by that family. And it is a horrible sadness and it's a huge tragedy. And it's also a salvation. I don't like to use that word actually, because it's not, I'm not a savior of my child. And I, oh, that always drives me crazy how people say, oh, you're so great for adopting. I'm like, no, I'm just a mom. I'm not like anything special. I'm just like you are. I just got my child in a different way. The same as my mom was not my savior. She's just my mom. Um, but it, it is, it is, especially having the breath of life experience I've had and the experience and knowledge about my bio family and my adoptive family. And then what I know of my daughter's adoptive and or bio family as well. It's a sadness taking a child away from the person who raised them. And, you know, we know so much about um, how the child um, carries so much of the mother physically with them through life. Mm -hmm. You know, like when a, when a woman is, when a, a woman is born, the mother actually is carrying her grandchildren's DNA in her at the time. So disconnecting from that beautiful physical connection is a spiritual matter as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's painful, but you have to celebrate the beauty because how can you not? I mean, there's always an and, right? This and, you know. Yes, exactly. It's a great way to put it. Thank you. I, I just needed to, to talk about that because I think it's such an important piece. And I think a lot mm -hmm. of people lose sight of that. Um, you know, a Very lot true. of people talk about the adoptee being the center and that starts in utero. And we can't forget about that can't forget about anyone in that triad. So here you are, you're seeking out your biological parents. Did you find them? What was that I like? I did. I did. <laughs> so I, you know, it's so, so easy to get caught off in different parts of the story. No, it's okay. My mom handed me her phone number and I was blown away. I, I I've told her so many times what a special unselfish thing that was for her to do because it, a lot of parents feel very um, proprietary over their children and Territorial. letting letting the other people in or opening up that door is is one thing. And my mom wrote me this letter, and I've I've shared it in a couple different ways. And the the gist of it is that you can love many people in many different ways, and loving one person does not take away your love from another. And she was acknowledging my need for this person or to reach out to this person and having a connection. But also that didn't, she understood that that did not and could not diminish my love for her and my family that I had been raised by. And I just thought that was such a beautiful, unselfish parenting act period. No, I'm getting yeah. a tissue out right now. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the most, I, my, actually <clears throat> my mom passed recently. And so mm -hmm. we had had long talks over the last couple of visits and I had shared with her how special that was to me and just how it spoke volumes to me about her understanding, even though she didn't have all the support we have today as adoptive parents or even anywhere in the triad there. It's like, it was such a quiet, closed, private experience. There were no, really not a lot of books. You didn't talk about it with people. There wasn't a lot of community support. So for her to come to that understanding on her own and having the grace to acknowledge that she saw my need and was okay with it was really special. Yeah. So I, I didn't do anything about it for a while. And then I called her and she was shocked to hear from me. I, I, you know, I said, here's my name. Here's when I was born. I just wanted to say, I'm not expecting anything from you. I, I, and at first I said, I just want to make sure I'm talking to the right person. She goes, you are. And my heart just kind of lurched. Right. And then she, she got all choked up and said, can I call you back tomorrow? And I said, sure. And turns out she had never told her husband about me. So this had been such a painful, difficult thing for her. She had compartmentalized it and not shared it with the people, you know, 24 years later 
for 24 years, she had kept that as a secret. I, what, you know, her parents obviously knew and one of her siblings I later found out, but so she had to tell her husband and it was an incredibly traumatic situation for her. So here I am really with low expectations. And I said, I've always wanted to tell you, thank you. I don't want anything from you. I, I would love to, you know, be able to talk to you and, and get to hear more about your experiences and who you are and all that type of stuff. And obviously the medical piece. Um, but I, I don't want anything from you. I just want you to know that I'm okay and that I'm happy and I've had a wonderful life. My family's fantastic and they love me very much. And, you know, just wanted, I just wanted her to know that, you know, so um, we, our relationship has really been limited mostly to emails about medical stuff. And I did meet her once and we went to lunch and it was very weird. <laughs> I saw like a shorter version of me. Oh my um, yeah, we're very similar in a lot of ways. And um, like, she didn't want to see any baby pictures again, just, I think for her, the only way she could cope with it is kind of compartmentalize it. And she was warm and lovely and told me, I don't even remember a lot of the details of what she told me because it was so overwhelming being there with her. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I brought like my photo album of baby pictures that just stayed in the car. And uh, that's kind of symbolic of what our relationship has been since then. Um, and we've emailed a few times over the years. Um, but she had asked me, she goes, have you spoken to your biological father? <laughs> and honestly, I said, I really hadn't thought about him very much in my whole journey. It's, it was always about my mother. Isn't that funny? I mean, there mean, there's a father in this, <laughs> right? They're like equal participate. Yeah. It's been in the making of said child, but yeah, uh -huh. it wasn't a hot, I don't know. It wasn't something I thought about. So, um, after that I did reach out to him and he lives, she lives farther away. He lives within driving distance. So he was like super excited to meet me. Uh -huh. And he had told me that he tried to find me at some point. Um, and I went and met him actually, and I wrote, um, an essay about it. That was, was my first published essay. Um, I guess I was like 26 at the time and it was like the, the Sunday supplement cover story of the mother's day, uh, newspaper down in Columbus <laughs> and they commissioned a piece of artwork for it and everything. And it was about the, ex the experience of finding and meeting him and his family. And he's got four kids and two step kids. And like I pulled up to his house and they all came pouring out and oh my God. it was, it was overwhelming. Frankly, yeah. it was like, like too much. It, and I've, and I'm in touch with, I have two half brothers and two half sisters and I'm in touch with them, you know, via social and um, we've all, you know, we all met in person then and I haven't seen them in person since, but um, it was really a lot. <laughs> It was a lot, but you know, he was a photographer. I'm very much into digital media, photography, video. Um, so, um, and she also is very artistic in her way too, and a writer. And um, we share a lot of uh, sensibilities and skills and kind of basic emotional components. Um, so that's, it's really nice to see that. But I remember seeing him in person and going, I don't really see the, <laughs> I don't see the connection. Okay. Um, but I got to meet my grandfather and both of them passed wow. away within a year of me meeting them. So I was very grateful that I'd had a chance to meet them. And actually my adoptive father went with me the second time to go see them because my biological father got diagnosed with cancer fairly soon after I met him. And so my adoptive father and I went to visit the family and spent time with them. Um, so I was glad they got to meet and that was kind of cool sharing that with my dad. Now, I know that you had this very unique revelation during, you know, this time in your life where you learned about your biological family. So can you reveal that to us? Yeah. Um, so a couple of years ago, I, I'm really into DNA and genealogy and exploring family history, which is a great irony, not lost on me. Um, so of my adoptive family, I kind of keep the big family tree and, um, and do all the research. And uh, when DNA tests were coming out, I talked to my mom, my adoptive mom and sister into uh, doing their DNA because my dad had passed and I, my sister was the branch to that part of the family. And I wanted to get my mom's history and I'd done mine as well. So I remember I was actually sitting exactly where I am right now. It, it was one of those DNA genealogy, not 
genealogy uh, rabbit holes you get into. And it was like two in the morning and I'm the DNA test had come in and I'm looking at my mom's list of all her DNA connections. And there I was. What? I am my adopted mom's fifth to eighth cousin. Oh, I, oh I started crying. It was like, are you kidding me? It was cr the craziest thing. And some people will say, you know, we're, our family's Jewish. I'm, I'm half Jewish. Oh, you really do look like her. Um, I don't know if I actually do. <laughs> well, so I'm genetically um, like maybe 60% Jewish. And my mom and my sister are 100% Ashkenazi Jewish, which is um, Jewish origin through Europe. Um, and so some people say that there's like a few degrees of separations between many Jewish people. And, but I'm like, there's a whole lot of Jewish people I am not biologically connected to. So over the next couple of years, I was able to, I think I know where the connection is. I think I know about like six generations back, which sister married, which brother on the branches of the family that connected where we shared based on how much DNA we shared. And it was so cool to find that I'm still, I'm, I'm still verifying. It's not, it's not a done deal that I know exactly when and where uh, that connection came, but I have a pretty good idea. And that was, I can't even describe the emotions too. And, and I try not to stress it too much because I'm not, as far as I, as I know, my daughter and I don't share any DNA and it doesn't change anything. Right. It doesn't change my love for her or how she and I fit together or why we're, you know, why we're family. Um, and so on that same side of that story, it doesn't change anything that I'm biologically connected to my family, but it, it feels really amazing. It's, it's very cool to know that there is a, a deeper connection beyond just emotional ties. That is really cool. Isn't and, you know, wild? yeah. And one day I'm going to pull together all these kismet moments and stories that come out of adoption, adoption journeys, things that happen that were meant to happen and just wild connections like this. It's, I, I love it. I it's love really it. special. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. Let's talk about your daughter and, and the adoption of your daughter. Just give us a yeah. broad overview of that process. And did you always know you wanted to adopt too? Like, do you think your adoption had anything to do with that? Or I always knew I'd be a good adoptive mom because I understood the feelings from both sides of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, I, I always figured I'd have a family. It wasn't like a driving need. Like I can't, I'm not fulfilled unless I'm a parent, but um, soon. So my, my dad lived in Cleveland. I was living in Cincinnati at the time and he passed away in 2002. And within a year I decided to move back to Cleveland where I'd grown up and wanted to live around family. And once I was here and I kind of, my my career trajectory had changed a bit because so I was going to, right before the day he died, I was literally moving to Boston to work on a national television show. And I was going to take my career to more of a national basis since I, you know, I was 40, 40 ish. And I hadn't gotten married. Well, I had I'd been married and divorced, hadn't gotten remarried, didn't have a kid in my life. And I'm like, you know, maybe I'll kind of pursue that and let's, let's see what happens. Honestly, my first thought, and I don't know if you ever had this thought as well, was like, I'm single. I'm Jewish, which is not a common thing. Like, why would somebody pick me to adopt their ch their their child? So well, that's I funny I because going. my consultant said, "You're single. You're Jewish. You're in your 40s. It's going to take some time." And three months right. later, I was chosen. Right, and it, it was one of those things where I was like, "Well, I'm going to take it out of my hands. I'm going to do the home study." You and I share a friend who had adopted um, internationally and had two. Um, older children who he became a parent to. So I had a little bit of a mentor who had been in it ahead of me. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, a friend who wanted to be a parent who was a single mom or who was a single woman and decided to go the artificial insemination route and biologically have a child. So I had people around me who were kind of in the same mindset, like, okay, I want to start a family. And I had mm -hmm. a bunch of friends who had moved away from Cleveland and all had moved back. And so I had this really nice network of people and I built my social network up when I came back here and I, you know, I was enjoying my life and I said, you know what, I'm going to apply for adoption. I decided very deliberately to, to adopt domestically 
because I'd had an easy time finding my family when I was ready to, I wanted to know that my child would also be able to pick up a phone, hop in the car and go meet their family if they wanted to. Oh, that's so. such a, that's a, that's a cool little intention that I, I would have never thought thought in that way. So I love that you. Yeah. And I, and I also that. didn't want to go spend six months in China waiting for a child and maybe not get the child and do that by myself. To me, mm -hmm. that seemed really harder. Mm -hmm. And um, so I applied, I went through a local adoption um, company, had my home study done, and I kind of threw my fate to the wind and said, if I'm meant to be a parent, I'll be a parent. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'd had a couple of close calls where somebody they like the way the adoption agency I worked with did it. You did like an eight page, 10 page biography with pictures and describing what kind of life you'd have and what you wanted to give to that child and kind of the lifestyle perspective. And so that was out there. And then you're just kind of living your life. And I'd gotten a call or two that's they'd given my profile to somebody because they didn't, ha the agency didn't have like a huge group of prospective parents, nor did they have a huge group of adopt of um, children that needed a uh, home. Mm -hmm. So it, it was, I would, I was thinking it would be a fairly fast part of the process where they would match you. So like they, I, a couple options came and went and I said, well, you know, we'll see what happens. And, and then was this private or, or foster? It was through welfare. Okay. Through so it's private adoption, not through the foster care system. Right. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, went on with my life, finished a big work project. I was a freelance video producer and writer at the time. So I had, uh, worked at home, traveled a lot. And then I, uh, had gone down to South Carolina. My father, my stepfather had retired. They were moving from California to South Carolina to be near my sister and the kids. And so I went down for the weekend, helped them unpack. And I'm playing cards with my niece on, on Monday morning and she's seven or eight. And I get this phone call from the adoption agency saying a little girl was born Saturday night and her bio mom chose me to adopt her. And if I agreed, I could pick her up on Thursday. So I'm in South Carolina. I have a room full of junk upstairs where baby room would be. I hadn't bought anything. So I really was not anticipating this. And I, apparently I yelled so loud. <laughs> came running from all over the house <laughs> thought somebody had died or something. And I, and all I could say was, I'm going to be a mom. I'm going to be a mom. And I was like, <laughs> like, just, I was like, I, I look, I have the notes that I took that day, like how much she weighed, um, what hospital she'd been born at a little bit about her background and ethnicity. And I was like overwhelmed. And I remember I, I said, I have to call you back and I need to just take a moment. And so I, I thought about it. I'm like, okay, this is it. I'm either going to say yes to this child or I'm not going to adopt. This is my moment. Am I up for it? And I had this very conscious moment of, okay, I'm in, let's do this. And so I called back and um, <laughs> it was just insanity from then on. I had, so that was what Monday, um, my sister and I spent like half of the day Tuesday at Target filling up my car with stuff. My yeah. mom drove up and stayed with my sister's kids. And my sister and I drove home Went Tuesday. I got to meet my daughter for the first time. She was staying in Chagrin Falls at a, um, a home that took care of babies for transitionary periods. Um, and I got to meet her biological mom that same day at the adoption agency. And it was so, so emotional just to meet her. You could tell this was intent. I, I, I don't claim to know how she was feeling because she didn't really share too, too much about it, but it, it was intense on both sides and very much aware of what a monumental moment it was. And it was, I just, it was just overwhelming. And I remember like went and putting the car seat in the car and my cousins kind of went into full Cleveland mode and started borrowing this and getting that. And you know, I, I sent out an email to all my friends and just saying, hey, I'm a mom on Thursday. <laughs> and everybody jokes about that email later because it, it was impossible to call all the people that were important to yeah. me to let them know. And I didn't have nine months to like unveil it or get used to it or prepare the house or even get insurance or pick out a name. So my nephew, who I'm very close with, and I went to the store and we're looking through baby books 
He's like, how about this name? I'm like, no, no, that's not quite right. I, I wanted to name the child after my dad who had passed away uh, three years ago at that point, four years ago. And, and so he actually picked out her name, which I ended up going back to later. And, and I was like, no, no, that's not quite right. And, you know, it, it was like a, a a few days of all that kind of stuff happening so quickly. So I remember holding her in my arms for the first time. She was sleeping the whole time, just looking at this child going, I'm going to be your mother tomorrow. This is in insane. It just seems so crazy and it happened so fast. So Thursday came and my sister went with me and was by my side throughout all of it. And since she's the mom of three children and my little sister, it was really nice to share that experience with her. And we brought my daughter home. That's so and, beautiful. you know, it was, it was 17 uh, years later <laughs> and now we're ready to go to college and move out. Oh my God. That's so crazy. Before we go on, we're going to take a quick break, but don't go away. We still have so much to talk about. Hey there, Adoption Roadmap fam. Are you ready to take the next step on your journey to parenthood? If so, head over to our website and take our quiz. It's called are you ready to adopt? It's not just about testing your knowledge. It's about making sure you're emotionally and practically prepared for the beautiful, complex journey of adoption. Let's make your dream of parenthood a reality. Go to rgadoptionconsulting.com and take the Are You Ready to Adopt quiz today. That's rgadoptionconsulting.com. The quiz is free and it will let you know where you are in the process, and if you're ready to jump into your adoption journey. So, Natalie, mm -hmm. you're a storyteller. Mm -hmm. How do you balance the need to tell this beautiful, compelling story with the ethical considerations of privacy and consent, especially when dealing with personal and potentially sensitive content? Um, because if you're anything like me, I want to shout from the rooftops everything about my story, and at a certain point, I'm like, "Oh, I can't! I, I, sh I can't! I, sh what can I share? What shouldn't I share?" Yeah, how do you balance that? You know, it's um, and if you notice, I haven't used her name. I haven't right. done, you know, explained, given any identifying information about her, um, because that's her story, mm -hmm. and I think my understanding of it now is much more acute and protective of her owning how she wants to talk about her life, mm -hmm. who she is. And that includes her biological family and her background and um, anything that she, that goes on in her life. You know, and again, I think this is a parenting issue for non-adoptive parents as well as adoptive parents. Yeah, I agree. Do not share your child's life on Facebook. It's not your story to share. And then once it's out there, you cannot reel that stuff back. Um, I think I was instinctively not totally out there. Like some people had been, I, even now I wish I'd been even less, um, mm. public about things just because of, you know, at the time it feels like your story I'm adopting. It's like my child, my family, and you want to share. And then comes the day when, you know, your child is old enough to say, why did you do that? I don't want people to know that about me. And I'm grateful that, you know, I, the people who I did share details with were in a real trusted circle. And I trust that they're never going to walk up to her and say, oh, I know that and that. But people forget stuff with age, you know, and like later, you never know what people might blurt out thinking it's just common knowledge or it's no big deal that they know about it. And I just think you put yourself and your child in a very vulnerable place. The more people who know your details and your child's details, the more you put them in a place of discomfort. And again, it's an ethical issue of privacy. Where does the parent's right to tell their story stop and the child's right to own their story begin? And it, again, it's not just an adoptive parent's story. It's a parent's story mm -hmm. to think about you know, when you're trying, and then this is kind of my rubric for how I judge a lot of things in my parenting journey. When she's 18 and an adult, will she look back and hate me for having done this, said right. that, shared this, you know, what, what is her story to own later? 
And if I let something out of the bag when she's younger, it's too late. People know certain things. And there's things that I think also can define you if, if you discuss them. So there's, I think, pieces of my experience I haven't really even talked to with her because mm. it was my experience of the situation. And it's not necessarily truth. It's just my perception. And so I don't want to share things with her that will make her feel some sort of way about it that might affect how she sees herself, the world. You know, I, I think we all protect our kids in some ways that way, but I think, um, you know, we owe them whatever they want to know about, you know, any truth that exists about her that she wants to know is hers to know. It's not the world's to know. So um, anything yeah. like I'm, I'm going to be doing some writing, some essays about some of the experience that we've talked about in greater depth and, um, it's a very meaningful part of my life that I want to share. And I'm very aware that it's my story is my story. It's not my, my, my mother's story. Also, I have, I want to be protective of as well. And this is, this mm. is kind of ironic because my adoptive mom, I know there's people in my biological family who don't know about me and uh, my adoptive mom always, ex always said that it's my life. I should feel free to contact them and reach out, even if that's not something that my biological mom was comfortable with. I said, I never want to be the one who comes in and blows up her life. That is not okay with me. So it kind of goes, there's both sides of it. I want to be protective of my daughter's story and give her the dignity and the responsibility to decide how she wants to share that. But also in writing about and discussing with friends and thinking about my biological family, like, where's my line that I'm comfortable with? So, yeah. and, and then here comes in another tricky little piece of this is DNA. DNA changes everything. Many people in the 50s, 60s, 70s even, yeah. who gave away children for adoption, didn't tell people. It was mm -hmm. a secret and that was yeah. their right. And legally, it was their right. DNA unleashes all of that because all of a sudden, like uh, my sister and I found that my father had a half sister we didn't know about. And she is a delight. She is a fantastic addition to our life, but that's who we are. We're cool with it. Not a big deal at all. My father would have been thrilled to have a sister. My, some of my biological siblings don't know I exist. And does that make me sad? Oh yeah, of course. But I also recognize that it's a secret that, my mom kept for many, many years and to have the secret revealed would also reveal that there is 60 years of her not sharing that with people wow, in her life. And that it's, I cannot be the person to blow that up for her. Yeah. I can't. As yeah, much there's, as it's so complicated. There's so much there. And I tell people there's no such thing as closed adoption anymore, period, the end, not in the world that we live in. No. Um, you know, Thanks, like, totally. Yeah on so many different levels. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, we need to respect our children and their story and all of that. On the other hand, sometimes we have a real need to talk about it so that we can um, get advice or how to deal with things. And yeah. I always think that within the adoption community, if you're sharing with other adoptive parents, I tend to think that they get it and they get the sacredness of it more than most other people. Mm -hmm. And um, if you find yourself in a safe adoptive uh, family community, that that could be a really good place to share those things, to, to seek advice, especially when it's not your really close circle of yeah. family and friends. I think our parents, as much as we trust our parents and love our parents, they may be because they, as we all want to share and shout from the roof, rooftops, people tend to share more information that they should. So should we be sharing this intimate stuff with our parents? You know, the last yeah. thing we want is for our children to hear something about them that they have yet to learn. That's the big crisis right. moment. You never want that to Oof. happen because I mean, then they feel you're not a trusted partner with them in yeah. this life, that you are part of the problem instead of you are their support and their love and their backup. That's the big fear. You know, who's going to, who knows what it's, a, it can be weaponized too, and it can be used against the child or, you know, 
people talking about them when they're not there. I mean, nothing could be worse than your child hearing something or frankly, that could end a friendship really quick if you hear friends talking about your child in a way that is less than what you would want. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, again, it's it's very personal information about the children's identity. So friends talk about, you know, we, if, I, I know, you know, you've got similar friendships to what I have where, you know, you sit and talk about parenting stuff and you talk about your kids in general and not necessarily connected to adoption or about their, their life or their history or their bio mm -hmm. families. But um, I think we all have to be a little careful <laughs> about wh what we say about our kids and, you know, what, there. you know, and about the people that we have in our circle of trusted, but, but at the same time, as a human being, as a parent, especially as a single parent, you need a circle of people that are your trusted people who will love your kid because of all the things that are shared about them and because of the issues that they bring to the world. And it doesn't make you love them less. Yeah. But you have to just pray that the people you trust are trustworthy. Yeah. Again, absolutely. you know, parents don't always have that discretionary off button. Like I shouldn't be telling the whole world about this. <laughs> I know we're, we're all human. We need to share. Right. And so Natalie, like me, you're a single mom, you're yeah. a, a mom through transracial adoption. You, you, uh -huh. you are white, your child is black. Um, from your experience, what are some of the most misunderstood aspects of transracial adoption and how have you addressed each, these challenges with your family and your community? Sure. Um, oh, that's a huge question. Um, I think I'll start by sharing when I adopted my daughter, I don't know that I, I mean, I hadn't taken any classes in transracial adoption. Um, I had grown up in a part of Cleveland that was fairly, fairly white. And I, I initially had said, um, you know, I listed all the, when you do the questionnaire for adoption, when I did it, you had to list whatever um, backgrounds where you were comfortable with. And I was like, you know, whatever, you know, whatever kid is meant to be, my kid will find their way to me and we'll figure it out. So I, I didn't really have any of the prep or any of the thinking about that. Yeah. I already lived in a very diverse neighborhood. Um, and just because I, I chose that for me, that was wh where I wanted to live. Um, and I had a pretty diverse group of friends. I would say a lot of my friends were friends from many years ago. So kind of fed more from my more homogenous background. So I had um, friends of different nationalities, some friends of color, you know, just did that I've, that I, especially people that I'd met since I've moved back to Cleveland and kind of my new, newer group of friends. Um, so I had a wider circle. My, fr our, our mutual friend had adopted um, some children from um, South America. Um, but that's not the same as, as um, adopting a child of African-American heritage. Um, and there's a responsibility that you take on when you adopt a child of a different race to immerse yourself as much as you can in, you know, how they're going to walk in the world. So mm -hmm. for us, a big part of that was her hair, um, making sure that her hair always looked nice and learning how to do her hair because she had probably... Um, the more it was, it was a big learning curve for me just because her, yeah. my hair, if I get up in the morning and I brush it, I'm lucky and it looks fine. It doesn't take, I'm, the, I'm not, I'm not a high maintenance person in any way, shape or form. So it was just having to be high maintenance about the care of her hair and to learn about it. So, um, you know, consulted with different friends. I read like all these books and got all the right hair products. And, um, one of my girlfriends whose hair is very similar to my daughter's bought us this great set of um, hair care products as she got a little bit older but like our challenge it was it was a weird combination of things so my daughter has sensory issues she's on the spectrum of autism and her getting her hair combed is when it's fine now and it's it's kind of a beautiful evolution but when she was young for the first 10, 12 years of her life, it was an extremely traumatic experience for her mm. to have her hair combed, washed, conditioned, and all the things that, that you know, that is say black beauty is, is not easy, but it's very important. And it was a whole learning curve for me to find the right people to help us along that way. Um, 
And I got to be really good at doing her hair. And now she doesn't want me to do it. She has a hairdresser and she mm -hmm. loves going to the salon and having that experience. And she's very proud of how she looks. And, and she, we kind of laugh about it now. But I mean, literally, she'd be sitting in her high chair and it was, I can't even describe for, for those of your listeners who have not had this experience, it can be an entire Saturday. It's a very normal routine in a black family for there to be a hair day because you have to detangle. You've got to take that old hairstyle out. You've got to do numerous things. And she would spend her whole time fighting me like that. So I would put her in her high chair. I'd do her hair for a little while. I'd go into the other room, cry for a little bit, go back in with a mm. smile on my face, try to distract her. But the funny thing was, I mean, it's not really funny. It was kind of um, symbolic of the difficulty of um, transracial adoption with that one aspect of it is that we would be out in public and I can't tell you after all these hours of having this very traumatic experience for both of us and walking out of the house with a hairstyle, black women would come up to us with the best of intentions. Well, I'll, I'm going to say with the best of intentions, I'm sure some people would look at us and be like, yeah, that's not okay. And respect, that's fine. People are allowed to have their opinions. So I kind of went into it with a state of grace of anybody who was approaching us was doing it out of care for this child because they wanted to make sure that the woman that she was with, this white woman knew what she was doing or could care for her hair appropriately because they're very concerned about making sure that this child is taken care of. And so again, respect for that. And I wanted to always think about how my daughter was perceiving this, right? And so they would hand me cards. Oh, here, have you tried this? You know, here's a great hairstylist. Here's this. And my child with sensory issues was not going to go sit in a salon and have a stranger detangle her hair. It was going to be whatever I could provide to her myself. But it got to the point where if she saw a black woman approaching us, she would hide behind me. Mm. And that just broke my heart. And I didn't know how to change that dynamic because she was too young to understand or be explained to, and I couldn't shield her from it. The only thing I could do is get better and better and better doing her hair so that anybody seeing her would just go, Oh, she's beautiful. Mm. And just leave it at that and not feel like they had to approach. And there was no good way to handle it. Even in retrospect, I don't know that I, there was anything I could have done differently. I got better fa as fast as I could and I tried everything and, um, you know, it was, it was a hard part of the journey for sure. Yeah. That's um, interesting. I hear that story a lot time and time mm -hmm. again. So it, I mean, it is that happens. And on the one hand, um, you know, besides the fact that she had sensory issues, having a hair day, what a beautiful way to bond and like, let go of the rest of the world. It forces you to just stay present with your, with your child. I mean, the fact that she had sensory issues is a whole nother dynamic of it. Um, <clears throat> how long do you think it took you to, to learn? And were you ever like, when anyone approached you, were you ever welcoming of that? Like, I was kind, I'm always kind. I mean, yeah, but I mean like, awkward. please teach me. I'm, I'm happy to have it. Or were you like you, I get it well, and you don't understand. We reached a point where again, even at that point, her story was none of their business. I'm not going to sit there and tell a stranger right. I, her hair would look nicer if she didn't have autism and it wasn't right. torture for her to get her hair done. That was no, nobody's business. I'm right. not going to, especially in front of her, I'm not going to out her, you know, person, very personal life struggles and our personal family struggles to perfect strangers. So that I had, I had a, basically I had to just suck it up and look like a bad mom and in knowing my heart that I, was not in that I was doing absolutely everything possible to help my daughter have a positive experience about her hair. Cause I, her hair is gorgeous. I love it. And I would pay her a lot of money to let me have a hair day with her now and just do her hair for her, but she loves her stylist and good for her and that she should have that. And, um, yeah, it was, it was a really weird combination of appreciation for the love. If that's what they were coming to it with instead of judgment, and also a huge frustration of just kind of sucking it up and looking like I don't know what I'm doing. And yeah. the problem with that is that as a white parent of a black child, 
you have to care so much more than if I had a child whose hair looked like mine and I can, I would just complain about having knots in it. Oh boy, what a great problem to have, you know? So um, I was very, I, I put more time and energy into the, the care and love of her hair than it ever appeared. And that was a little hard to take, but yeah. it is what it is. Um, she knew that I was doing what I could for her. And I think she understands more now. And like we joke about it now, kind of wryly and say, okay, well, you know, that was part of it. But um, I always made sure like our that whatever school she belonged to, she was not the only child of color there. I think the hardest thing was um, in our religion, there aren't a ton of families with children of color. There's a lot more now than, but there's not like one congregation you could say, yeah. I want to be with like, there's 10 other kids that look like her. So she would walk into the, our religious organization building and she might be one of the few people of color and she hated it. And um, mm -hmm. she went through the whole um, uh, you know, process of going to religious school and became bat mitzvah and was very, and she's very proud of being Jewish, but she's also keenly aware of being one of the few black Jews here in Cleveland. And I hope as she gets older, um, you know, there's a, there's like a national organization called the Jews of Color Initiative that we're members of. She doesn't want to participate in it. And that's fine. I do it because our family is a multiracial family, mm -hmm. even if I personally am not. Well, I guess I technically am, too, from my my DNA. But yeah. but from my my lived experience, I am, you know, pretty homogenous, appearing at least. And um, so I try to have the information available. And we have lots of books in the house about transracial families and about um, black Jews and excited to go to places and other cities where they have larger groups of people in which she might find people who also have had the same lived experience yeah. of being in a religion where you're kind of an uncommon face. Yeah, it is hard in the Jewish community and and hopefully it is changing. I see it changing slowly but it surely. Is. When we lived in Chicago, it was very different. Like in, in my son's um, religious school class, he was one of like nine other kids who were joined in their family through adoption and all transracial and it was beautiful. And then we moved to Cleveland and it was very different looking. There are a couple luckily in his friendship circle um, mm -hmm. that make it much easier. But um, so you have, we talked about how you're a storyteller and um, how has your personal journey through adoption influenced your professional work? And tell us a little bit about what you do. Sure. Um, so I've been a, a professional video person my whole career. Mm -hmm. um, about um, a little bit after Melina, ugh, I've been a professional storyteller, video producer my whole career. Um, a little bit after my daughter was born, I realized I could no longer fly all over the country to shoot videos. Um, I can't go to Morocco to do the gift of sight program for lens crafters again. So I'm like, okay, how am I going to reconfigure things? And I started doing a lot more script writing, a lot of local production, working with um, like big local organizations and trying to figure out like what that's going to look like to be also home with my child as much as possible. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I came up with this idea. I was, I, I'm in love with StoryCorps. It's an NPR. Or, uh, yeah. I, I'm trying to think. So I'm in love with StoryCorps. It's a nonprofit organization that helps individuals tell their story, but they're preserved on audio in the National Archives. And I started thinking, well, there's a lot more stories that need to be told that people don't want to share nationally, but in why, why are not they showing the videos of this, the interviews? Because videos are, you know, all the expressions and the things that are really uh, uniquely personal to a person, you can't always hear in their voice, but when you see a conversation, it's so much more meaningful. So I ended up developing an app that was uh, called Simply Told that um, would allow people to record their stories on video in little bits and pieces. And then I worked with libraries, museums. We did a documentary um, with some local Holocaust survivors and just really would sit down one on one like this with people and record their stories. And I just find this, the process of sitting across from somebody and giving them your full attention and telling, telling them to just share their stories with you and be an active listener and really caring about what they're saying. It is the most, to me, it's a really special experience. Um, 
people trust you because they can tell you care and they open up and sometimes share things that they haven't even shared with their own families. But you're in a moment of preserving that for the, the future generations. And um, recently, one of the people who I had interviewed and really became close friends with um, over at the Soul and Senior Center, um, we had had probably 10 different sessions of like an hour or two and really got to know him well. And he passed away, I guess, about a year ago. And I was able to make sure his wife had all the stories that he had shared about yeah. his family, about his history, his time in Vietnam. And it was so meaningful to me that I was allowing them to preserve a piece of their history. So even with my parents, I've sat down with both of them. My, my, my stepdad is still here. My mom just passed away and my dad died um, 20 years ago. And, I, and that was right before I started doing all this. So I at least have my mom and my stepdad's stories told in their own voice. So that's kind of my passion is making sure people have somebody to sit across from and sit and tell their stories to. And, um, you know, maybe my daughter will tell her story about her adoption one day or about our life together and good for good or bad. <laughs> I'm sure she's going to have lots of opinions about what I could have done better as yeah. most children do, but yeah, that's, that's kind of my professional world. And I do, you know, business videos and market product videos, all sorts of all different stuff, but I'd like to start doing more writing, more personal um, creative writing. So it's kind of the next step of the journey after this and adoption and my adoption stories and perceptions will definitely be part of that creation process. Well, there's a ton of stories out there and what a beautiful way to preserve your story, especially if you start, um, you know, I always tell our families, uh, in fact, we give a journal when they start um, the process to write down the story as you go, mm -hmm. because it's a beautiful one. And even, even if it doesn't always feel like that when you're in it afterwards, what a beautiful way to, to share it with your child. Do you have yeah. any advice you would give to parents, to prospective adoptive parents, especially if they're considering transracial adoption? Um, think about the people in your family. Think about if there are people who have prejudices or who mm. are the mouthy ones who are going to say whatever they feel like they need to say mm. and imagine that child being in front of them and every Thanksgiving and every birthday, are you okay with your family being around a child and hearing it? Just think about what they say when there's nobody of color around and think if you're okay with your kid overhearing that and make sure that your family, your extended family is a going to be part of your life. And if they are, you're going to need to make some decisions, whether that child can be around people who are not going to be kind and not supportive a hundred percent because, um, to be a black person in our community, if you're going to have a, a person in your family that you're bringing in to a non African American family or not a family of color, you have to know that that kid is going to feel 100% loved, not just by you, but by everybody you're bringing into their life. And, and, and also just be super open to thinking about why you don't have people of color in your life if you don't. And if you, you, you can't bring a child into the world without seeing it through their eyes. Mm. Um, the funny thing is my daughter has said to me time and time again, you know, why, like if I have a group of friends over people that I went to high school with, she'll say, well, why aren't any of them black? And I've explained to her, I'm like, well, when I grew up, it was fairly segregated as much as it was like beyond my control at that point. The only thing I can control are the people I've chosen to bring into my life after. So maybe certain groups of friends of mine are going to be all white, but our neighborhood's never going to be. The schools I've sent you to are never going to be. And we have to be okay to talk about that. So you know, you have to be willing to be honest with yourself first, mm -hmm. but recognize you're, you're responsible to that 18 year old version of that baby. Yeah. They're going to hold you to task. Becca, you'll, you'll, you'll tell them the same yeah, story. I love, I love this advice is really great. And I sat down with my parents before I adopted and we went through all of the criteria and we had a conversation about race and I'm so glad that we did. Mm -hmm. I want to um, wrap up. Thank you so much for, I mean, this was, this was so great. So much insight and so many little golden nuggets, I like to say. Um, mm -hmm. I have a couple rapid fire questions I want to end with. <laughs> um, who is a person or an organization that has had an impact on your adoption journey, no matter where in the, 
in your adoption journey? Sure. Well, I think every adoptive parent needs to have a parent mentor, a friend or someone who's a little bit farther ahead along the journey than you that can guide you. So I have, I, I think I mentioned earlier, we have a mutual friend who has now two adult children that he adopted from uh, South America. And I've called him a bazillion times. And he actually, he and my daughter are super close, which has been really lovely. Um, And he, his experiences are not always the same as mine. His kids' experiences and issues are different than my daughter's, but he is a sounding board for me. So I would say, make sure you have somebody who is on the same journey, but at different stages. So I remember, I remember Becca, when you were considering adoption, I remember a conversation you and I had, and you were just trying to learn more at the time. So again, it's good to have people at various stages, maybe somebody that you can be a mentor to and have somebody that can, is willing to show you the ugly face of the hard part about whether it's single parenting or transracial adoption or whatever the case is in your parenting journey, have people that are walking the walk with you because it can be lonely otherwise. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just need a sounding board to say, am I doing this as well as I could be? And please give me some tough love. I need someone who is open enough and willing enough to step back and give me that observation that I can't see for myself because our kids deserve it. Our kids deserve us to be self-critical. Our kids deserve us to question the way things are being done at a certain time, um, the way that society approaches adoption. If we don't feel like that is the best thing for our kid to give our kid that space and resources that work for them and not to just go along the party line of what the common way of handling talking about adoption is. It's okay to kind of have a different path, but it's, it's good to rely on yourself, but also have other people who will help you hold a mirror up to yourself and how you're parenting and what you're providing your kid. Awesome. What's a book or a podcast you're either reading or listening to right now that you love? Doesn't have to do with podcast, with adoption. Ah, um, Well, my daughter will tell you, I am addicted to the Outlander uh, series by Diana Gabaldon, and I probably gifted the books I think they're up to, to number nine or number 10. Now I've gifted the books multiple times and actually my computer is perched upon four of them. So they're very, <laughs> I love it. Books. I love <laughs> time it. travel and science fiction. So it's good. Describe adoption in three words. That's a really hard question. Optimism in a baby. Thank you so much, Natalie ba- Bauman. And if you are listening to this podcast, as Natalie said, sometimes it's more fun to watch it in person and you can go to YouTube and watch this interview there too. I hope that you got some or a lot of golden nuggets in this episode. We drop a new episode every Wednesday and Friday. So leave us a review. Let us know what you thought and tune in next time to the Adoption Roadmap podcast. Thank you so much for joining. Bye-bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Adoption Roadmap podcast. If you did, I have a few favors to ask of you. First, please hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. And while you're at it, I'd love to hear your takeaways. Please write a review and let me know what you liked. And if you have a question or a suggestion on what you'd like to hear, I'd love to hear that too. Please shoot me an email at support at rgadoptionconsulting.com and let me know what you'd like to hear about. And if you have a question, I may just answer it online. Thanks again for listening. Tune in every Wednesday and Friday morning for a brand new episode of the Adoption Roadmap Podcast. Until next time, bye-bye.